Right, so I'd, what I'd like to do is to take uh, a little bit of a, of a, a, a slightly random walk uh, around RSA, some of the problems with RSA, look at some of the new cryptography methods, touch base with Chinese remainder theorem, uh, because RSA is still open to that, to that problem. Uh, there'll be a little bit of mass, not quite as heavy as Alan's mass, <laughs> which is uh, scary, but there'll be a bit of, a bit of, because we're in the home of John Napier, well, not quite, he, he, he's, he, was, he lived down the road there, but we'll pretend that we're in the home of John Napier. Uh, then, uh, then, then we'll touch base with, with, with John and, and we'll try and understand uh, cryptography. Okay, so I'm going to look at, is it the death of RSA, some evil code, evil code, uh, breaking crypto, I'll show you how I broke the internet, kind of. Uh, so I'll, I'll outline that. So all the examples are on that site and, and go ahead and tweet if, if, if you want to. Okay, so I'd like to really look first at, at, the, at, the, at the death of, 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 of RSA. Uh, so RSA is your true defender of your rights to your identity, okay? RSA isn't used really internals. When you're connecting to uh, Google, you're using good old symmetric encryption, which Owen will crack in a little minute, but uh, you're using that good old workhorse of AAS. RSA is much too slow. RSA is used typically to prove your identity and also to prove the identity of, of Google. Okay, so it's your protector for, for uh, identities. So we'll have a little look to see uh, what uh, the problems are. So this guy was, is Martin Gardner uh, here. So Martin Gardner, very distinguished mathematician and really is a real inspiration because he could, he could say, he could tell you mathematics, he could explain mathematics to you and you would actually understand it. Uh, uh, there isn't many people around like that. I'd ask you to go and read some of Martin's work, really inspirational. He wrote for the Scientific American at, at the time. And he had a column, and the column, in this case, it was uh, Mathematical Games, was, uh, was the paper. And it was these three, we won't call them hippies, it was about 1977, we'll call them punks, punk was around then. <laughs> I was just, uh, I think I was just leaving school then, that was that, that long ago. And uh, these, three, these three guys came up with an amazing concept that Whitfield Diffie had thought about and said, it will exist, a trap door will exist. I can create two keys when I use one key and only the other key will actually decrypt it. So Whitfield Diffie came up with that idea, but it was these guys uh, that came up with it. Anybody tell me their names? Not for a prize. <laughs> That's right, okay. Who's your favorite? Oh, you can't see it on camera. <laughs> We quite, everybody likes Revest, but we actually like uh, Shamir as Lou here. Uh, uh, we, we're really inspired. Shamir did a lot of that basic stuff. You actually find that most of crypto was founded in the middle 70s and hasn't really changed that, that much. I hate to say it, but it's still these guys who really uh, created it. Okay, so he created, uh, he, he, he uh, set that, uh, that uh, 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 call him up, and in it he said, uh, here's, if you want, if you're really interested, so they gave a little puzzle that you were to solve, and then they said at the time, uh, why don't you contact us with a stamped addressed envelope, remember those days, before the email, uh, and we'll stick the paper in the post, uh, and, uh, and that'll be fine, so MIT will actually send that out. And obviously, some people said, what's going on here? <laughs> oh, you, can't, you can't do that. By what time it was too late, I think 20, 30,000 of these envelopes had went out, and they, a lot of them went out to non-USA uh, countries. Uh, but they came knocking on the door of MIT, so you've got to pull the paper, and they said, no. <laughs> we have academic freedom. Our researchers have the right to publish. It's funded through a research grant, and we want to do it. So the tension was, was there already with, with this. And then we, they received letters such as this one. 
So this one here has said, you just cannot publish that. That cryptography is equivalent to a nuclear bomb to our enemies. You cannot publish uh, that. So some people approached the IEEE at the time and said, do not publish this, this is dangerous uh, work. So this is the letter that actually says that really it shouldn't be allowed to be, to be published. And then there was other, other letters that came after that saying uh, it, it appears to, to breach the export uh, regulations. Does anybody know what they did to stop it getting out of the US? What was the, what was the thing? And, and it's been the Achilles heel of SSL and the internet. And do you know what they did? The key they, they minimized the key length. How they did that, who knows? But Netscape, I don't know if anybody remembers Netscape here. They do, and AOL. Bzz, that, that getting online with AOL, that was fun. So uh, they limited the key to 512 bits, which Alan will tell you is, is easable, easily crackable by your fridge. Not quite, but maybe your iPad from there. So they did that, and my God, has that caused uh, problems. And so that was a 512-bit key uh, size. And then Len Alderman at the time said, oh, I'll just stick my name on that paper. It's just kind of all right. So he, he thought this wasn't really an important paper at all. Uh, and they put his name on it, and obviously it's been a highly significant paper. So that was the, that was the birth of RSA, and at the time, the Ron in the interview, and when Martin Gardner was writing about this, uh, they did a quick calculation, 63 digit uh, prime numbers, which is kind of crazy these days, quite small, uh, and they reckoned it would take 40 quadrillion years. So in the 1970s, that sounded like a long time, and I appreciate it does sound like that uh, now, so there's an example of 78 digits. That's the kind of numbers that it, that it actually comes up with. <laughs> but uh, so I've included the Stranglers who were around in 1978. <laughs> I don't know if anybody remembers them. I certainly do. Uh, and uh, uh, Moore's Law. Moore's Law, double processing power. I hate to say it, but if you, if you half, 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 by the time you get to 2015, four quadrillion years actually becomes uh, 3,000. 3, so that's the problem with crypto. That's the problem with crypto is that after just a few years, because of the increasing power of the processor, then it becomes quite easy to, to, to crack it. So there's the team. That's the guys. That's the guys that, uh, that we are uh, uh, really focusing on. Uh, Bob, uh, good guy, bad guy. Depends who you are, I suppose. <laughs> Alice, okay, we got to make sure that they can communicate with each other securely and that they prove their identity because who can you trust on the internet? No one. No one. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you didn't say Google or Microsoft. <laughs> so, uh, or Facebook. Facebook. We'll, we'll choose Facebook. Uh, so, unfortunately, you've got to bring this guy in called Trent. Oh, my God. Trent is PKI, Public Key Infrastructure, Digital Certificates. Yuck. <laughs> Disaster. Okay, this has been a complete and absolute mitigating disaster uh, from there. And then, like it or not, you've got to think like Eve, be like Eve, uh, our Eve. Eve is our, is our clown here. Okay, so, so Eve wants to pretend to be Alice, Eve wants to listen to the communications, and so on. So when it comes to evil code, so evil code and evil numbers. Okay, so we've all got our favourite evil number. 666 is one. So this is a real bus, a real bus. <laughs> I mean, who, who in their right mind said, well, okay, and the number of the bus, 665, 666. Okay, that's the, that's the, the bus of the evil. So we'll, uh, we'll do that. So it's a real bus in the Far East, 666. 13, uh, <laughs> actually, this, uh, the, the, this Belgian airline had 13 dots. <laughs> and had to repaint another dot on it, just so it, it wasn't seen. People weren't getting on the flight because they counted the number of dots on it, and it was 13. So, the, uh, so this is the problem. 
But the most evil, 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 evil of all numbers are prime numbers, as, as Alan will, 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 will tell you, okay? 13, is 2 a prime number? <laughs> yes, okay? It's the shortest book in the world. Sorry for bringing in a joke. Shortest book in the world is the even prime numbers. It just says 2, end. <laughs> So 13, 7, 23, 101. So in RSA, what we do is we take two prime numbers and we basically, we take one away from them and we multiply them uh, together. And that gives us uh, the core of, of RSA. If I can factorize N, then, then RSA is, is finished. So as Alan said, uh, we've kept up with this because we've just kept making the numbers bigger and bigger and we'll still keep doing that, but it gets to the point that it's a bit crazy. The most evil piece of code, I've done that. Has anybody done remove? Yeah, you've done it. Anybody else? Remove, yeah, yeah. remove. Ah, don't do it now, okay, don't do it. That's pretty evil, it just goes woof. And there's none of this undelete stuff, undelete, undelete, it just woof, it's gone. Uh, print, hello, do wow, that's pretty evil, and things like that. So that's. Those are, those are evil, but there's an even more piece of evil code and there it is there. So that's the, the, uh, the Java code for uh, RSA encryption, okay? That is the most evil piece of code known in the universe. That is the code that terrorists can hide and people that do bad things can actually hide from it. That is the piece of code that keeps most law enforcement awake at, at night, okay? For us, it can be good because it protects our identity and we don't get scammers and so on. So we end up, cipher is equal to message to the power of E uh, mod N uh, and message, when we decipher, we take D, take it to the power of D and then take mod N and everything's fine. We end up with, a, with two keys, E and then N that we tell everybody, that's our padlock, and then D comma N is what we keep private. N is not secret, but P and Q. Does everybody get that? You got that? <laughs> Good. Right, so I'll show you a little bit of uh, breaking <coughs> crypto that was a bit unfortunate. And uh, so here's, here's how it works. We do two, two prime numbers uh, together, uh, P and Q. Okay, we take one off them and we end up with a value called phi. Okay. And we remember n, which is p times q. So hopefully you're all following that. That's great. Right, this is the thing that gets most of our students, but they get there in the end, is that you've just got to find, I know you're looking for a formula here, but there's none. You just need to find something that doesn't share uh, the same common factors between phi and the e, your encryption key. That's, that's all you have to do. There's no magical formula here. You just have to find the number that doesn't share a common factor with 20. Can anybody tell me the factors of 20? 4, 2, 10. As long as we don't pick them, then everything is great. So we pick three, and then we have our key pairs there, uh, and we can go ahead and we can find out our decryption key. D times E mod of the phi gives us one and we can pick our E key. So that gives us our D and E. Then on the other side, when we cipher, we take the encryption key, and then when we decipher, we take the, the D key. And because we're in John Napier's uh, university, then a lot of what is the focus of this is around discrete logarithms. And discrete logarithms are all about the difficulty of actually finding the original value when you raise something to the power of a value and then take a mod of a number. It's very difficult to find what that original value was. So the problem that, that researchers had initially in cryptography is that how does Bob and Alice get the same key? And the way it was solved with the, was, was with this method here. So this is Diffie-Hellman's method. We take a, a value that both Bob and Alice understand or know, a G value, and we take a P value and they both agree on that. Alice generates a random number A. Bob generates a random number B. Alice sends over G to the power of A, mod P. Uh, Bob takes that value and raises it to the power of B. 
And through the magic of logs, if you remember at school, g to the power, a, power of a to the power of a is actually g to a, b. And on the other side, Bob does the same calculation and they end up with the same key. So this is the core of, of how we, we create a session key, how we get a key for every single uh, session that, that, that we create. OK, so I'll show you how I kind of broke the internet uh, and I apologize uh, for this. <coughs> if I end up uh, cracking RSA, I certainly won't post it on LinkedIn and tell the world. I'll be going to the IEEE or ACM or something like that. <laughs> uh, so if, if you see something on, on LinkedIn that looks as if I've cracked something really serious, then it's probably not. Uh, have a wee look. It'll probably say something like, this is a bit of fun or this is just a little example and so on. So I kind of broke, I kind of broke the, I broke the internet and uh, here, okay? So this was the article that, that I did and it was a quick factorization of, uh, of the values. So here they are here, I can show you the factorization. This was a little program I created and all it really does, so I think I can crack that number there, hopefully, good. So you actually find I can, I can pick extremely large numbers and I can factorize it for the, for the two factors of it, okay? I wasn't claiming that I'd cracked RSA at all. I could crack these long numbers, but certainly not uh, the, the kinds of numbers that you would use in, in RSA. Okay, you can look at the article later. Uh, but, then, uh, but then I got this as a tweet. So somebody thought that I had actually broken uh, this. Uh, and then somebody went and changed my, my, my Wikipedia page uh, to say that I'd actually cracked it. <laughs> but then somebody else changed it to something else that maybe it wasn't. It says something like he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> so I think it was Richard that told me that this had been, had been changed there. But it wasn't really a, a, a real crack that, that I'd done. It was just really a demonstration of it. So one of the methods that's used quite extensively in, in cracking RSA is the Chinese remainder theorem, and it's still relevant. And the Chinese remainder theorem involves uh, the solving of this type of equation here. So the x mod 3 equals 2 and so on. Chinese remainder theory can actually determine what the value of x is uh, efficiently. So I can solve it here uh, and we can see here that for that equation the value of x is 23 that will make that actually work. And this can be applied in, in cryptography. If we look at the three equations here, we get three people to encrypt a message with the same encryption key and look at the, the ciphers. If you actually go through the mass, it's possible for you to find out the value of M uh, given the, the ciphers that are resulting in. And in this way, you can actually crack RSA because you don't actually, uh, you know the encryption key and you know you can solve for the value of x uh, there. Okay, you can go through the maths, and the maths work, uh, but it's a very efficient way of, of cracking RSA. So what about the new cryptography that's happening? So I think it was mentioned earlier about homomorphic cryptography. So why do I have to give away all my data uh, to someone if they want to do a calculation? So if I want to calculate the average uh, salary of everybody in this room. Everybody needs to give me their the values and then I calculate them, which means I'm giving away uh, data. So it's possible with, with cryptography and with homo, homomorphic cryptography to actually do a mathematical calculation on the ciphers and get a result. With RSA, it's possible to multiply I think that's the only operation that you can do in it. You can't add and subtract, you can only multiply. So you can go through this example uh, here, but it's possible for Bob and Alice to create and cipher two things together, two numbers, cipher them, and then uh, Eve can, uh, can actually determine the result and, and it can be decrypted. 
And there's the mass behind that. Again, it's based on John Napier's work. You can actually see there when you, when you multiply them together, we can actually do it by just multiplying the, uh, the, the values. And there's some really amazing code out there that does it in JavaScript. So this code here, if it was working, this code here will actually do the calculation in JavaScript. Just let me generate my key pair, okay? That's what uh, homomorphic keys look like. I can encrypt, okay, there's my two values for three and four. Uh, I can then calculate A plus B. I can then calculate A plus B times C. And then at the very end, I can decrypt uh, the value and I, and I get it uh, back again. So this is important because it allows us to be able to keep values securely, even though we keep them on the cloud. So the ultimate is that we end up with something like that. Eve wants to calculate uh, the sum. It's possible for, for her to take the two values that are ciphered and still work out the answer. So when it comes to new cryptography, and there's a whole range of devices that are uh, methods that are being proposed for uh, quantum robust methods. And I think as Alan highlighted, a lot of them are based on classical, uh, classical linear codes, data communication codes, error checking codes, and so on. So what we need to do is to create a puzzle that's so difficult for a quantum computer that it can't factor in a reasonable time. So if you're interested, this paper goes back to 1978, uh, and it's the McLeese method. Uh, but we have examples of, the, of the, 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 the keys. And what you'll actually find is a lot of these methods, the actual size of the key is much bigger. So the days of us having small keys, like 1,024 bits, are gone. We might be looking at key sizes that are megabytes in, in, in scope. So that's one method, as was highlighted by both presenters today. The other method is to look at uh, lattice. Uh, cryptography. And then there is another one, uh, unbalanced oil and vinegar a method, again, uh, based on uh, a, a trapdoor uh, function. And the difficulty of solving uh, multivariate polynomials, if you have 5x plus 4y plus 6z uh, and so on, if you have a number of them, it's actually quite difficult to find the value of x, y, and, and Z from, from them. And then the last one is based on Ralph Merkel's work uh, about having a, a tree of, of hash methods. But the, the method that's really taken off just now, and it's what Google are using an Apple to harvest data from, from devices, is what's called differential privacy. So the problem that you have with, uh, with an SQL database is that is that if I'm not allowed to look at the, the salary of, of people in a database, uh, but I'm allowed to look at the average, if I take 50 people and take the average and include you, and then I knock you off the search, then I can mathematically show what your salary is. Okay, so they have a key means, key and anonymity, where I'm limited to key searches, uh, but I can still find out exactly. In an era of big data, that's a big problem because you're releasing the core data uh, 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 from, from the, the searches that you do. So differential privacy is all about adding noise to the data that you collect so that you can collect data on, say, gender or the usage without actually revealing the core data and the person behind the data. And that's what most companies are interested in. They're not that interested in you, per se, because they've probably got that information, they're more interested on usage. So differential privacy involves that half the people tell the truth and the other half of the people tell a lie. So they intentionally tell a lie. So in this case, the top group tell the truth about their gender and then the bottom group flip a coin and say I'm male or female. And it's not really possible to tell who's telling the truth uh, or, or, or not from that. So differential privacy is all about actually not revealing the, the core uh, data in there. So Google have implemented it in their Chrome browser, and they can harvest vast amounts of data 
from the users because they add noise uh, in, into it. Okay, so that's, that's one of the methods. And the last method is what's called commutative encryption. And commutative encryption involves that it doesn't matter in which order you use the keys. You can use the public key first, encrypt, uh, you can encrypt with a public key and then encrypt with, with a private key. You can then decrypt with a public key and decrypt with, an, uh, with a public key and the private key and that works. Normally you've got to unpick the encryption as, as the way that you've actually put, put the encryption on. But cumulative encryption allows you to put the keys on in any way. It's a bit like having a hasp that you put locks on and you can take the locks off one at a time. So this is a method that you can use to book a ticket at the Edinburgh Festival. Basically, the theatre can actually create uh, a whole lot of tickets. It then encrypts it with its own key. Okay, so we have here a whole number of seats that can be booked, A1 to A3. It then sends them over. The user picks one of the, one of the bookings and has picked A2 there. They then add their encryption key onto that and sends them back. The other side can't actually tell which seat you've, they've actually, you've actually picked. But they take their key off it and they send it back to the person and the person will then decrypt with their own key. Did anybody get that at all? No. <laughs> it takes a bit of thinking, but it does work. I have tried around the theatres and they just, they just, no, no, we're not interested. <laughs> We like, we like the old method. So this is called zero knowledge. This is the future. <laughs> this is the way you reveal too much of your information uh, when you actually do anything like book tickets and so on. Does that make good time up? Thanks. And, uh, and that's me. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Um, so obviously, who has some questions? I can't believe that nobody has any questions. Yes? How long do we have left to use RSM before it's hopelessly practical? How long left? Uh, so, I think so, that's, the question, that's so, so the question was for the video is, uh, how long do we have left before uh, RSA is rendered obsolete? Uh, I personally think that RSA is almost obsolete because nobody understands how it works. I th I've, I've seen crypto teams and banks and, and I've spoken to so many professionals and they have no clue about how RSA and public digital certificates actually work. So I, I, I really think we, we need to change to something quite soon. Probably Alan has got a better estimation. <laughs> a lot of it obviously depends on um, when teams like this come up with viable quantum computers. But um, we have made a standard in our paper, which is probably 10 years most, but I think anybody that if they're building a new system, if they were to go to RSA now, it would probably be a bit silly, because it's, it's known to be slightly... It's worth saying about RSA that there is no... It's not provably secure. There is no formal proof of the security of RSA. All we know is that it doesn't appear to have been cracked yet. But we know there are some, like, you know, the Chinese remain theorem, the thing we were talking earlier on. There are plenty of classical algorithms out there um, for factorizing, so who knows? I mean, I, personally, I, I wouldn't use it. Who, who has another question? Yep. If we wouldn't use RSA, what would we use? So, so the question was, if we don't use RSA, uh, what would we use? Uh, one of the four methods that were... <laughs> That were, that were there. So, so Google implement a, a, a new uh, quantum robust method in Chrome. You can download the, the test Chrome app uh, and have a look at it. Uh, I, I, I'll distribute the screenshots of it, but you can actually see the, the, the quantum keys. They've taken their own method uh, to do it, but this is them experimenting. So if Google are, are doing it, and we know of many law enforcement security or agencies that are really interested uh, in, in, in creating applications that, that, that they use it. 
so it's, it is happening. Google have, have got a prototype now. So can I just add something there? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to see, then we've actually done a review of the page, yeah. which uh, it is worth reading. The, um, the, the, the one that's showing the greatest promise at the moment, the lattice space, and in particular a thing called ring based, but ring, ring with learning with errors. So if you re re look up ring LWE, you'll find. And the one that Google have released is a, is a variant of that called New Hope. And they've actually put it to their TLS suite. So it's actually, it's actually there now. But uh, there, there, are, there are plenty of others. Um, Google NTRU, there you go. Um, the, the only problem with NTRU is there are various patents on it. Um, so people are wondering whether it's a good idea to use that. And also, LWE has some advantages from a performance point of view. Um, at least, it, the, as you say, the key sizes are so large. Um, uh, the UOV ones, um, there are, there, again, it's the provable security. It, it reduces to something that we think is provable. Secure, but we're not absolutely certain, which is why I think a lot of people really are looking at the lattice based ones. And, and if, you, if you're into Python or, 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 or Java, we, we've actually included uh, source code for each of the, each of the methods. So th this is a Java one for the, uh, the unbalanced oil and vinegar uh, rainbow method, and we've got the Python code that allows you to do the, 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 the latest one. So we went ahead and actually implemented. It was really difficult to find source code, uh, and we had to mix between Python and, and, and Java to actually get it. So if any students are looking for interesting projects, then it's a really interesting yeah, it's one. It's worth saying, if anybody is interested in doing any research and actually building something, there are, despite the fact that everybody knows you've got to go through these post content, there's a lot of theoretical work. Um, out there, in terms of actual implementations, um, there are relatively few. I think Bill's site was probably the first one that had the, the, the sort of the full set. Do, do we have a, uh, one, one final question? So the other side of this, well, if you think of something like online shopping or banking, it's not just about encryption, it's about proving identity as well. Can these, uh, can these algorithms do that kind of thing in RSA? Some, some yes and some no. Things like NTRU, the lattice way of those ones, in fact, not so very long ago, there was an NTRU signature-based scheme that came out. But it's a good point. Um, one of the ways that certificates and identity, proofs of identity have grown up with RSA, people have sort of begun to think of them as kind of synonymous, and they're not. So signature schemes and encryptions do need to be approached differently. And it, it might well be that certain candidates for post-quantum crypto Turn out to be, um, that they might be a slightly different candidate for the But I think public key generally focuses on identity anyway and signing things. So it's all about signing and proving identity. So I think AES is unbeatable in terms of performance and will never be beaten. So that this is really hashing methods and signing. Yeah, and this, again, it's worth pointing out, of course, we talk about public key encryption. For most dialogues, say, in the e commerce situation, the public key encryption is only used for the first part. You're only, effectively what you're doing is encrypting the key that you exchange and then use symmetric AES or something like that. So, which is much more efficient because public key encryption by its nature is very inefficient. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Uh, was one final comment? Elias? Uh, can you tell us more about this Google's quantum system? <laughs> I've got I've got a link a LinkedIn a, a LinkedIn article on it and how you actually find it. I, I, I could demonstrate here, but I, I, I wouldn't uh, I, I I wouldn't be able to find the, the parameters for it uh, somewhere yeah, like. Yeah. Well, they're they're testing it on on you 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 get a you get a, and I can't I just can't remember where the settings. Uh, are for it. Uh, just have a look in there. Don't you just love Google for their their settings and, and Chrome? I think it's got a search. It's got a search. F uh, we what we're looking for. <laughs> Give me help. <laughs> Give me help here, Elias. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll 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 publish it. There is there is a setting there, and y you've got to sorry. Uh, it's you've got to download another app. It isn't isn't Chrome. It's another version of Chrome that looks like Chrome.
<laughs> Fantastic. E excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, so, thank so you. Uh, big round of applause for, for Professor Buchanan. Thank you very much. <laughs>